This conversation is with Mark Bernicker. Mark is a well-known serial entrepreneur here in Switzerland. From the early age of seven, he started thinking and looking at the world through that lens of entrepreneurship. He started his first successful business right out of high school. During this conversation, Mark tells us about those many adventures spanning the era of the internet, the early days of Bitcoin, crypto and digital assets, and now ending up in a venture of his in the field of longevity, where his business looks at the science and the economics of extending the human lifespan, or more importantly, the human health span. With Mark's very optimistic outlook, he reminds us of the fact that we should not just look at the challenges and the risks that exist out there plentiful today, but also to remember that there's always opportunities. I hope you enjoy this conversation. If you have any feedback, do let me know. And don't forget to click on that subscribe or follow button wherever it is on that screen of yours. So, uh, Mark, welcome. It's uh, really great to have you here. And, um, you know, let's get right into it because we've got a lot to cover. Uh, you're kind of the proverbial serial entrepreneur. And um, as far as I know, you started early. Was it was 18 or when did you start your first company? I mean, my first entrepreneurial business was literally at uh, seven in school when I had like a small school kiosk uh, <laughs> in Arosa back then and mm -hmm. went to the grocery store and bought some sweets and sold them with a certain uh, uh, premium. So, so you really uh, have it in your DNA then. Exactly. <laughs> Buy low and sell high was already a, a certain business of mine when I was in school. Yeah. yeah. Was that, did that come from your parents also or did they, did they, or was that just you? Yeah. I mean, my grandfather was an entrepreneur, uh, but my parents were not really in an entrepreneurial setup. So sometimes they also thought maybe it's better just to do the regular corporate path where you have a monthly salary. But uh, yeah, when they saw that I'm passionate about and it also somehow worked out financially, they became a little bit more relaxed. Maybe. So when you, during your high school or gymnasium here in Switzerland, uh, kind of entered the party scene on a professional level, yeah, they, they supported that. Yeah, I mean, I, I also had after my, my uh, grocery kind of business, I had a school magazine in uh, college together with a good friend with whom I then started my first internet company. So literally... That so that was, was Usgang.ch. Exactly. Yeah. And before there was... It's a, hard to translate that. And I guess that would be... What is Usgang.ch in English? Going out. Uh, going out. That's like the age. That. Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> yeah. German. So we had no international expansion plan. And uh, yeah, just literally uh, save the domain because we thought that's a fun, fun term. There was also this claim, let's go out together, Gömerinusgang.ca, that was literally a little bit like a marketing claim. Okay. And yeah, started without a big vision and business plan. Yeah. And how, how old were you when you started that? Uh, 19. 19. And so that uh, was right before the Matura, before you graduated? Yeah, literally it was right <laughs> after the Matura, yeah. Okay. And uh, okay. because we both were early in the internet, we were literally the only ones with a private internet access. What, what year in was that? Uh, in 99. Okay. And uh, then we launched in January 2000. I think 3rd of January 2000. So you were one of those internet companies that actually survived the 2000, the Y2K. Yeah, literally <laughs> we started in the peak of the bubble and were not really directly affected by the bubble burst. But yeah, we were literally in the middle of this first big wave of internet companies. Yeah. So, so what exactly did Usgang.ch do or offer? I mean, nowadays it sounds a little bit silly, but back then you literally had no sources uh, online to see where you want to go out. So literally you, you took the newspaper and on Friday there was maybe a list of some events. So what we did in the beginning, we just took all the newspapers and put all the events in one spreadsheet and put it online, very straightforward. So we had like an Excel sheet and then put it into an HTML code so it was accessible online. And back then there was literally yeah, no, no platform or, or no source where you could just via your computer. I mean, mobile internet was not existing back then. <laughs> so literally people before they went out, they went uh, to our platform and saw what's going on uh, in Zurich uh, when 
they wanted to go out. And what was the business model? How did Usgang.ch make money? I mean, in the beginning, it was mainly that we were targeting uh, these young uh, nightlife audience, right? So more and more advertisers realized that if they do a traditional ad in a newspaper, they maybe lose part of this audience. So we had a very niche focus of these young, nowadays you would call them maybe millennials. Mm -hmm. And then going forward, because more and more people came to our platform, we had all the organizers and clubs paying us to literally promote their events, to have okay. photographers there. So it was a little bit like on the one hand advertisement and on the other side content, uh, which we were able to sell. I see. So you did a lot of on-site analysis as well, I, I assume. Yeah, for you us, at, I mean... We're at all the parties. Yeah, checking. the peers <laughs> were the organizers, the clubs, the DJs, so the whole yeah. nightlife industry. And what was interesting, I mean, I think back then it was also a bit the beginning of the professionalism uh, of, of the whole nightlife industry. Yeah. Because uh, I would say before year 2000, it was mostly like a side hobby business. And then, I mean, also when you look back, all these big clubs and these franchises <laughs> like Basha and all these big brands nowadays, yeah. they literally also started in a very unprofessional way. And then at a certain point, they realized with all the DJs and everything that it's a huge business, right? So it was really the building of a community and then the business yeah. came. Advertising was not that great then yet, right? So it was mainly the, the revenue from those clubs. That yeah, but uh, um, advertisement became quite big because we had, for example, all the mobile providers. Mm. We had exactly this audience. When, right? when was that? When when that started? Two thousand two, three, okay. four. Right. Because then, I mean, you had all these emerging. Most of them disappeared, but all these yeah. emerging mobile providers, yeah. and they knew that's exactly the audience. And then we had a lot of car companies. In the early days, it was also that was like a gray zone. You could do advertisement of, yeah. of beer and other uh, lifestyle products, right? So that's why it's it was quite an interesting. A target audience to to uh, yeah for the advertisement industry. And how long did you do that with Uskang Pontea? When when was that? Uh... I mean, I literally went out of the operational business when I graduated uh, from university, okay. because I always said as soon as I leave university, I don't want to be in the party business anymore. <laughs> so literally, after my uh, I studied law after my law degree, I went out of the operational business, and my my co-founder. Uh, continued to run it until we sold then the company to to Axel Springer, the German uh, publishing house. Yeah. Axel Springer, exactly. that, was, that, that was the exit. When was that? That was in 2006. And was, was the iPhone, did that exist then yet? When did that start? Because that, yeah. made, that must have made a big difference too. In, in all yeah, but I remember when we literally sold the whole mobile internet was not really a big thing back then. It wasn't really there yet. Yeah. And it's also interesting when we started all the big publishing houses, they were literally laughing at all these internet platforms. Yeah. And when we sold the, the platform, I mean, nowadays all these uh, nightlife party platforms were acquired by big publishing houses because they missed a little bit this young emerging uh, web audience. Mm. So instead of building their own platforms, which they never planned, they had to buy all these platforms, right? So it's a good example how by focusing on a niche, mm -hmm. you can literally yeah, enter uh, existing markets and become an interesting target for, for these big players. Really using, using a pain point or really solving a problem. Um, that at first looks small, but then it just uh, creates something bigger. Yeah, and I mean, so. I can tell you, I mean, because we had these photos, uh, there were some uh, weeks where uh, our platform had more page impressions than all the big Swiss media outlets together, right? Because oh. on Monday, most of these platforms didn't really have a web presence or not mm. really a sophisticated one. So on Monday, and again, we had no mobile presence back then because there was no real mobile internet. Everybody went uh, in the office uh, because most people also didn't have internet at home mm -hmm. and checked out these photos, right? So we had huge page impressions. They wanted to see whether they were exactly. on the pictures. Exactly. And, and there was no Facebook, no Instagram exactly. and all that yet. So that's <coughs> for, for young people, that's something hard to imagine that back then it was all on the computer. It, it was, was not, on, it was not on the phone. Yeah. And then honestly, I mean, we sold, um, luckily, a few months before Facebook came to Europe. And then literally, I think in a one or two years, Facebook took most of 
the uh, audience from all these platforms, right? Okay. So maybe that's something uh, you. So you, you picked the right moment. Exactly, it? it was really um, because oh. suddenly nobody was on these platforms because everybody was on Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. So Facebook mm -hmm. literally replaced yeah. the where do I go, where are the photos. So this use case, all these nightlife platforms literally had was absorbed to a more to a big extent by these social networks like like Facebook. So you had a good instinct. What in in all of those ventures or adventures that you had? What was the next? So what were the next steps? I think Xing was also something that you did, right? Or uh, I mean, I, I then after Uskang.ch uh, co-founded a ticketing platform called uh, Amiando. That was uh, till 2010 when Xing acquired the platform, and we literally also looking back, it sounds silly, but we brought. The payment process and ticket buying process, especially for business events like conferences, to the internet. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it's quite common, right? But back then, the normal procedure was that you sometimes with a fax machine or with a call or with a letter, you registered for a business event and then you got the batch sent to you via postal mail. So again, something which is um, quite normal nowadays that you register for a conference uh, online yeah. was not really uh, mainstream back then, right? So, we so, had to so you started that, you actually sent those batches home to people? I mean, no, we then literally had an online ticketing platform. So oh, we called okay. all these conference organizers and tried to explain them that it's maybe better to register online. <coughs> and then the feedback was mostly, hey, we have an online registration form. And then it was a Word document you could print out, fill out, and send it and send in. via letterbox. So that was a little bit uh, the competition we had, right? So you never actually worked as a lawyer? I mean, I did one year because I studied law, but mainly worked for my first company. Mm -hmm. So I thought now I have a law degree, but I never really saw a law office from inside. <laughs> so I decided to do one year after my graduation working for a law office uh, in Zurich. Okay. But honestly, yeah, realized that I now know how it looks from the inside, but I'm maybe not <laughs> not a, a passionate lawyer. So I yeah, literally continued my entrepreneurial journey. What were the next steps after that? I mean, when we uh, sold Xing um, in 2010 and the company was based in Munich, so I, I spent four years oh, in okay. Munich because all my yeah. co-founders were from there. I came back to Switzerland and uh, was honestly fascinated after building and exiting two uh, internet companies which literally were to a certain extent disrupting existing value, value chains by bringing it uh, to the web that the financial services industry where most of my friends worked in was still uh, very traditional right mm -hmm. so it was literally easier uh, yeah to I don't know buy a conference ticket <laughs> online than have your personal finance relationships or everything which is somehow finance related online yeah. and that was a little bit the trigger for me to focus on nowadays you call it fintech we called it finance 2.0 on businesses where you saw uh, yeah disruption and digitization of financial services also today maybe quite an obvious one but back then i mean 2010 it was extremely it was early niche. games. It was very, yeah. very niche, right? So, was that what, when did you actually uh, found Crypto Finance Group? When was I that? mean, Crypto Finance was founded in uh, March two thousand seventeen. Okay, so that was uh, that was actually much later. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's why for me, I had a little bit like a journey into fintech, then Bitcoin in two thousand twelve. So, I was always interested in in new and emerging uh, things, but normally. I mean, the moment where it makes sense to really build a company is not in the early days because there's no market mm -hmm. back then. So I think with crypto finance, it was exactly the right time frame because for the first time ever you had traditional institutions moving into digital assets, even if it was quite a few years after I experienced or got in touch with digital assets that you had literally the right moment to start a, a real business out of it. So crypto finance group, just so uh, so those watching understand, um, those in Switzerland will probably be familiar with it, but but for those that aren't, um, that was also quite innovative, right? Because it was uh, one of the first banks or first companies that actually took a 
to get banking license in the crypto finance space? Yeah, I mean, crypto finance never went until the full banking license okay. because our business model was literally based on three pillars. One was asset management. Mm -hmm. So there we had uh, as the first company back then in Europe, fully regulated asset management license, only focusing on digital assets. So we were the first fully regulated asset manager by the Swiss banking authority um, in 2018. Were those mainly funds or also managed accounts then? That was mainly funds, yeah. Okay. And then we had the brokerage business. There we had like uh, self-trading uh, without any guidance from us, right? And there we also got the full uh, broker's dealer's license, also as one of the first ones worldwide back then. And then we had the uh, storage business where we help institutions to store their digital assets. And these were literally also from legal and regulatory uh, standpoints, three independent companies, mm -hmm. but all under the umbrella of, of crypto finance. And that was maybe, as you said, quite unique because we fully focused on established players from traditional finance, mm -hmm. offering them fully regulated uh, frameworks to move into the whole digital asset space. So it was mostly B2B then? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. I mean, we had in the beginning some ultra high net worth or individuals using our platform to trade, mm -hmm. but the core business model was always B2B. So when you, I would say in 2018, when you did any uh, trades via a bank or asset manager or some other platforms here in Switzerland mm -hmm. in a regulated way, I would say 80% was executed via crypto finance without... So the technology realizing. was behind exactly, that. Exactly, the trading desk yeah. and everything, yeah. So that was very early then, I mean, in terms of using that kind of technology, taking care yeah. of all the key storage, did you offer cold storage as well then? Yeah, the full, the full package, yeah. Okay. And also there, I mean, we had, I mean, most of the collaborations were not public, but for example, Swissquote, mm -hmm. one of the biggest trading platforms in Switzerland, I mean, they were using our storage solution for their clients. Mm. So everybody using Swissquote was literally indirectly a client of crypto broker without really realizing it. So that was maybe a little bit the uh, uniqueness because uh, when we sold the company, a lot of people sometimes even didn't hear about us, right. but we were in the background definitely a very relevant player in the whole space. Is that still the case? So, so Deutsche, was it Deutsche, uh, Deutsche, Börse. Ex, Deutsche Börse? Yeah. So the German exchange exactly. actually bought the company. Exactly, yeah. So is the technology still in the background at this point also for some of the Swiss banks or is I mean, that's that literally still the same. So same business model. Besides so. that, I didn't know that. a new okay. majority shareholder. Okay. I mean, and uh, many additional clients now because you have a big player behind. But the core business model is exactly the same, right? So yeah. it's just yeah. a different shareholder structure, yeah. Maybe before we go into what you're doing today after Crypto Finance Group, um, that infrastructure that you've built with uh, with Crypto Finance, um, is that, to what degree is that going to grow into a competition for platforms or exchanges like SIX, for example, or SDX? Yeah. Is, yeah, that, I mean, is there we... a cooperation there or is, <coughs> is, that, is that more of a competition? There? I mean, now with Deutsche Börse as the main uh, shareholder, it's rather I think in a competitive framework yeah. but when we started we talked to all these exchanges and similar mm. to my first experiences in 2000 with the publishers right mm. there was really no interest and especially understanding about how digital assets become something which is part of the traditional financial services world mm. that's why yeah there were among others, Deutsche Börse is some players who understood this development and that's mm. why they uh, moved into this space and other ones were maybe a little bit more on a conservative uh, path. So that's why, um, yeah, I think you still have uh, a lot of naysayers, naysayers and they don't, see the, don't really see how these two worlds are coming together, right? Yeah, maybe we can touch on that a bit later. Um, the, um Maybe just a, a quick question. One last question, because it's really interesting, is is the group still growing? So is that business model still going well after? Because sometimes, you know, when you sell something, even if someone big comes yeah. in, um, it might not really still have the same drive yeah. and, and momentum. How How is the business doing at this point? I mean, I have to say I'm completely out of the business. So yeah. I sold all my shares and yeah. left the board. So I'm not involved in yeah. uh, 
so in you a can, formal role. You can talk freely. I can talk freely, <laughs> but I'm also not as involved anymore. Right. But I mean, the, the headcount literally more than doubled uh, okay. since the acquisition. Interesting. And uh, as you might know, the company is now in the prime tower, so really yeah. one of the top floors. So everything was a little bit, let's say, pimped uh, to a certain extent, right? Yeah. And now with a, a multi-billion dollar company uh, behind, there's definitely a, a quite aggressive growth uh, strategy behind. Interesting. So, I mean, it's not like they acquired the company and now um, it continues in a normal organic path. There's a quite a extensive uh, growth route ahead, which is ultimately always a little bit depending on the market in general, right? If you mm -hmm. have a bear market, all exchanges and, and trading platforms suffer. But I mean, from a strategic perspective, there's definitely a quite a aggressive growth path ahead, which is also evolving since the acquisition uh, yeah. two years back. Yeah. Uh, Very cool. Um, I think now to, to look at you know what you've kind of what you've put your eyes on now and again you're 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 into things that I think um, you know are are future oriented. One area obviously is digital asset digital asset investing, alternative investing in general. I think with regard to digital assets, that obviously is being discussed a lot. But there's also that second topic that you've now. Uh, started with longevity mm -hmm. so so we'll touch on that a bit but let's start maybe with uh, just overall the um, um, the aspect of alternatives and private markets to what degree um, do you find that interesting at this point why why your interest in that sphere mm -hmm. yeah I mean I would say as an entrepreneur you normally as long as you're not doing what everybody else does and then you're normally not a successful entrepreneur you always have a certain alternative route right i mean either you're earlier than others or you do something better mm -hmm. or different so that's why for every entrepreneur the whole alternative asset space is something where they maybe also in their daily <laughs> life are literally surrounded all the time right mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. why i mean you can always have a traditional portfolio and buy into blue chip stocks or whatever but I think to a certain extent, um, you have a very close connection to the whole alternative space. And that's why for me, um, as an entrepreneur who always wants to build something new from scratch, instead of just taking the money and then give it to somebody else to, to make it grow, right? Mm -hmm. I think um, there are just many very interesting opportunities in, in private markets which are maybe also from an entrepreneur pr perspective far more appealing uh, than, than traditional uh, asset classes. The private markets are also growing more quickly than, than traditional markets. It's um, um, time-wise, I mean, we've discussed this a few times. It's, um, it's also from our perspective, it's really interesting at this point, particularly to be in private markets and alternatives because what used to work might not work in the in the mm. near future in the next 10 years because you know we talk about new era and actually in that um in that uh, fireside conversation with Suna Sorensen I think you did you watch that mm -hmm. or Suna made a good point saying that looking forwards investors will have to do extraordinary things to get extraordinary mm -hmm. outcome mm -hmm. and ordinary things won't work anymore so beta you know investing basically with the markets is going to get much more difficult yeah. So from, from that agree. standpoint, yeah. I think it's definitely the time for, for alternatives and private markets. Um, there's, in general, what people say about, about alternatives is that, you know, there's, there's access to a wider range of investments that might not be in the, uh, in the public markets. There's less regulation to some degree, which also in some cases might be more risk, um, potential for higher returns. Um, but overall, I'm, um, one of the things that is is difficult for for um, you know for investors to get into those markets is unless you're an entrepreneur and you're yourself you're mm -hmm. doing it you have issues like transparency you know actually knowing your way around digital assets is is one example of that mm -hmm. uh, liquidity is often an issue um, you're in it longer that can have pros and cons because you're also maybe not affected as much as in the public markets the swings of the mood um, but in, in your take, if, if you look at private markets versus traditional markets and um, the areas that you're interested in, 
how big is your exposure? How much would you actually put into private markets rather than traditional markets? Yeah, it's always a little bit the question how you structure it in general, right? And what you would really put into one of these two buckets. But I mean, I think most entrepreneurs are by far uh, heavily overexposed, maybe <laughs> roughly to 80, 90 percent, yeah. just because, I mean, I think if you if you made your money by building companies, it's part of your value exactly, is, and you also are company. passionate. I mean, yeah. for me, it would be quite a dull um, experience to literally have eighty percent of assets in some ETFs, even if they maybe outperform uh, the market slightly, because then there's no passion behind, right? I mm. mean, you should definitely have some uh, part of your wealth without uh, having bad sleep all the time. But on the other side, uh, I think this focus on, on something which has an impact, which uh, has a maybe double dividend because you generate more than just financial return and you have passion involved, is maybe one of the reasons why, again, alternative assets and private markets are, are more appealing to certain investors. To a growing number of investors. Yeah, exactly. too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we um, we you and I we actually started talking about alternative investments and digital assets in particular. Um, I think it was uh, maybe summer of twenty one or uh, was it twenty twenty? I forget. But we kind of described the big picture back then as artificial, bloated, and overdue. Mm -hmm. And um, you know there was obviously where we see the change now is we had ultra loose monetary policies and fiscal policies for a long time. We had, um, you know, excessive public and private debt as a consequence, financial market imbalances and, and very topish markets, which we've now seen some corrections. Now we have rising inflation and interest rates. And that all of that has been accompanied by other big changes, including a global economy that is slowing. Uh, we have negative demographics, uh, not just in the West. China, for example, is is hugely mm -hmm. affected by that. It's one of the big problems they're dealing with. Uh, an energy crisis in the West due to some of the energy policies and strategies. Um, growing geopolitical and social tensions and also a confluence of new technologies and innovations. So that was kind of the big context or the big picture backdrop that we kind of saw and said, you know, this would be an interesting time to start and uh, look into building something in the alternatives space. And what then came out of that was really uh, alt alpha strategies to some degree. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe in your words, uh, alt alpha strategies, if you describe the idea or what the vision is for alt alpha strategies, what how would you describe that? Yeah, I mean, high level, I would say giving access to alternatives which are maybe not accessible for most people in a very professional and diversified way to literally participate in the huge upside uh, which is in these new emerging fields in a very uh, uh, high level um, perspective and then additionally I mean starting maybe with uh, digital assets I mean I think if you believe in a world which is becoming more and more digital, which is, I think, happening all around us, and if you also follow a little bit the developments of, of the web in the early days, let's mm -hmm. call it web 1.0 and then the web 2.0, web 3.0, I think the digitization of assets, of money, of everything which goes beyond information is a natural involvement of what started with the digital revolution. And that there's maybe something alternative to the traditional monetary system which is based on many things but definitely not on a digital revolution. I think that's for me quite obvious and from this perspective what started with Bitcoin and is now evolving with all kind of different uh, digital asset projects is, is for me just a natural evolvement from, from this digital uh, revolution. So if you believe in uh, the continuous development in this field, I think you somehow have to have exposure into this space. And uh, again, I think everybody should read the white paper of Satoshi Nakamoto to understand a little bit what's behind and then maybe get some exposure. And the next step, if you're looking for alpha, um, is alternative alpha in the digital asset space. So mm -hmm. alt alpha digital is maybe the best explanation of this specific product. Yeah. So literally have somebody uh, screening all these um, 
alternative uh, asset managers generating alpha based on all kind of interesting strategies and then going further from the digital space to the traditional uh, traditional space i mean hedge funds also something um, you have many perceptions, um, but I think just looking at the facts, it makes sense that you have a certain allocation in this field. So that's then the reason for the other product. For all weather. Exactly, yeah. the all weather product. And then gold as maybe the most uh, traditional and well-known uh, asset in the alt-alpha universe. Also something which just makes sense to have a uh, allocation uh, in the portfolio. So then literally you cover from the most traditional to the maybe most exciting field, um, everything which is happening in this alternative space. Yeah, if we look at, I mean, those three funds that we've created and we won't, uh, we don't want to make this, uh, you know, a marketing event too much, but Alt Alpha Strategies basically has started and launched with uh, three funds, the Alt Alpha Digital, the second one is Alt Alpha All Weather. And the third one is the Integrity Gold Fund. And it's ultimately what we were trying to do is to create, like you said, kind of a portfolio, an array that is suited well for that new era. And the new era to some degree is going to be harder to invest in. Um, and so basically we're covering with the Alta Alpha Digital something which is, um, you know, in terms of risk profile is more speculative. All weather is really in the moderate zone where it's, it's performed at low volatility and creates very steady returns since 2018. Last year too, I think uh, the fund closed with around 7% uh, plus, not negative, and then Integrity Gold. Um, you could say, well, who needs another gold fund? But there too, we're being innovative in a sense that there are a lot of gold funds out there. Um, some of them have big claims. You know, First of all, they certainly say they're fully backed mm -hmm. by gold. That is not always completely <coughs> true. Um, there's also other, you know, marketing positioning pieces where they say they have, uh, you know, gold that is green or it's ESG and so on. The problem with those products is that very often they're not really that transparent. So what we're doing with that fund, again, something innovative is to show that um, using the technology of Exedras to show each bar in the fund and actually being able to drill down into the details of that gold bar where did it come from who produced it and so on so that's kind of the array of, of funds that we've created for for that new era that's and, also uh, integrity in the name is not just a a nice label it's really explaining what's in it right so correct. that's why yeah yeah, yeah for me it's the sense. product integrity <clears throat> is something basically um there's so much greenwashing and, and marketing out there and uh, product integrity in my view um, is something which can not be defined as a as a black and white truth. It's it basically comes down to doing and delivering what you're promising. So what you say on the packaging should also be inside, and that's that's what we've done with that gold yeah. fund. So that's Alt Alpha strategies, and now we'll go back into more general discussion of of uh, digital assets and maybe also the Alt Alpha digital investment strategy mm -hmm. and um, there maybe to, to start off I mean with uh, with uh, digital assets in general I think um, maybe just stepping stepping out one moment you had that conference that, that crypto finance conference mm -hmm. in St. Moritz mm -hmm. recently um, 2022 was not such a great was not such a great year yeah. what was the mood up there what was the outlook and maybe the Basically, the concerns are also the opportunities ahead. Yeah, I mean, I have to say we started this format five years ago. So literally January 2018 was the first event in the midst of the ICO craziness, right? And uh, have a quite specific positioning. So only investors you have to apply, very selective. So I would say people in St. Moritz at our conference are mostly heavy believers, right? So it's maybe not the no neutral and objective overview of the market but yeah. i have to say and now i mean the last few weeks we had a certain positive developments right in the space but separate from that um it was extremely positive because some of these negative happenings which are bad for the whole market in the short term but maybe will help to uh, further professionalize the whole ecosystem right because you had too much leverage still too many short-term 
oriented investors which are still not really understanding the underlying potential of everything in the space. So that's why the, the crowd and the investors we, we had in St. Moritz were, were really very positive because they have a true understanding and belief that it's the beginning of something new. Mm. So that's why yeah, I was also surprised that there was not a yeah. More. So it wasn't it wasn't a funeral. It was still a, a bit of really a party. It was really very very yeah. positive, yeah. and uh, yeah. during the day and also in the night, there was not not really a, a negative sentiment in the air, which was also a little bit confirmed by some of the journalists, which were also That's surprised. very telling. Yeah. yeah, I mean, to some degree, you've been here before, and uh, some of those yeah. other investors as well. I mean, to what degree are you reminded of what happened back at Y two K and you know other? Other, other yeah, periods it's a, where I think just... it's a, it's a maybe natural development that you have these over exaggerations and these hype cycles. I think in crypto, what's unique, it's just on steroids and far <laughs> faster, right? So sometimes people say what you experience uh, in a month is like in a year in every other industry, right? So mm. it's extremely fast moving, and maybe also because everybody has somehow a possibility to be part of this sometimes really crazy developments that it's maybe a little bit too broadly covered and followed mm -hmm. because in the early days of the internet you also had these IPOs but it was still not something where everybody was somehow involved and with crypto I think there are still a lot of people who somehow jump on the bandwagon before try to understand what's really happening in the space. Um, Coming, coming back from St. Moritz, what, in, in your view, like who, you know, what are the big trends or use cases that, that were discussed up there or seen as like the next Yeah, I mean, what's definitely step? becoming now, because it was always mentioned, but I think the development uh, was a little bit lacking behind that you really have this convergence of the traditional world and the digital asset world. Mm -hmm. I mean, we already had some well-known hedge fund managers in the past, but now it's really becoming an uh, incremental part of the whole industry, right? That you have fully regulated, well-respected, very successful asset managers, uh, funds and other traditional players, including government uh, institutions, right? Which are really understanding that the whole uh, development goes far further than the short-term price of an underlying. It's really about the potential behind. Mm -hmm. And I think also this paradigm shift that the uh, the Western world somehow doesn't see the long-term value of a decentralized, not government-backed uh, monetary system is uh, completely different as soon as you leave uh, Western Europe, right? Because you have still billions of people which have no access to literally uh, build savings or be part of the traditional financial services system, mm -hmm. even in a digital world, right? Uh, it's still a huge problem with the unbanked uh, all over the world and I think digital assets for the first time ever uh, open an alternative way to somehow yeah be part of something and build wealth uh, for the next generations and I think this this use case which is becoming far more tangible uh, is also becoming more visible maybe for people who only saw the short-term speculation in it. I think um I'm completely with you, and I think where we agree is that there's there's huge potential in um, blockchain technology and also digital assets. And what you just said, I think, is really important for people to understand is that digital assets and the world of cryptocurrencies and and uh, tokens is really starting to merge with the traditional world, and that process is underway. So our position, I think, our joint position is we want to be part of that story. And uh, the question, I guess, for investors then is, how do I take part in that? Uh, apart from, you know, going into Bitcoin and Ethereum and, and uh, also really being, you know, exposed basically to, to all that volatility. And that's kind of where our, our investment approach is, has evolved. Exactly. And I mean, like in non-digital asset uh, spaces, right, you can always try to identify uh, the winners, but then you're more like a venture capital investor, right, with all the risks and, and, and upsides attached. Or you try to identify serious counterparties which literally do the job for you and give you to a certain expen uh, exposure 
uh, to these exciting developments. So these active managers, exactly. these talent, it kind of reminds us of uh, what we had back when the hedge funds started originally. Yeah. Into traditional field. Now it's now it's the same thing in digital assets. So so what our approach, I guess, was is to say let's let's find that talent and and invest with those for active management to have a diversified portfolio of those digital asset hedge funds. Exactly. Um, yeah. What's so that that approach of that fund of funds approach? Where do you see the benefits of that? You know, why why is that a better approach than kind of trying to to do it ourselves or to have a manage uh, to have a management strategy or an investment strategy that uh, goes directly into those different assets? I mean, honestly, also in my own case, I invested in in crypto funds. Uh, I mean, my first one was I think in two thousand seventeen. Back then, there were not that many <laughs> regulated ones. And it just needs a lot of time, right? I mean, because now you have hundreds of uh, of fund managers, and we only talk about the the hedge fund ones, right? So if you do the whole venture capital, I think you can talk about thousands, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it just takes a lot of time to, because instead of screening the companies uh, or individual strategies, you then screen the funds behind, right? Which is sometimes even more complex, I would say. Um, because it's not just the gut feeling that the founder is a passionate entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So literally taking this job and giving it to somebody who literally in a full professional way only talks to these managers is already a huge added value. And then on the other side, I still have a, a location into several funds, but it's not in a really diversified way, right? I don't have, that's also a job of the fund of fund manager, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you have a smart allocation and the distribution into several strategies which ultimately also help you to hedge risk ideally take the full upside but also limit the downside mm -hmm. and uh, literally it's a full-time job right so that's why if you're not really fully uh, involved in the space and have nothing else to do i think it doesn't really make sense to build your portfolio yourself right yeah i agree i think there's there's several constraints and limitations and one of them is liquidity, the other one is access. Um, if we look at what we've done now with uh, Alt Alpha Digital is really um, to use a, an investment process, a professional investment process that we've used and tested for quite a few years in the, in the traditional yeah, hedge funds area. Yeah. And now we've kind of converted that. The difference, I think, and, and that's where it's, it's great working with you in that project, is that um, it's harder, you know, with the, with the traditional hedge funds, you can find those hedge funds on Bloomberg. You know, you can do filterings and mm. rankings, and and um, in the crypto context or digital asset context, those funds are not that transparent yet. You know, you don't really have that access and that level of information yet. So it's sometimes we talk about in German, it's the Trüffelschwein mm. approach, right? Mm. <laughs> where, yeah. where basically um, you are in that network and you know you get to know those managers, and that's really currently still extremely important for that sphere so that we can find the the nuggets for the future right yeah and i think i mean as you said it's still not in a way institutionalized that you have the same terminals or access points where you just find the best managers a lot of them are quite new they're literally starting uh, like everybody from zero they don't have huge assets yet but they still have solid track record and the professional setups yeah. but it's difficult to identify the ones and as we all know just because you're the loudest one doing marketing doesn't automatically mean that you also generate long-term alpha right. and i think that's also a very crucial role so a lot of my uh, friends investing individual funds with stellar performance after some of the happenings last year literally lost everything mm -hmm. because there was not a proper risk management or everything installed. Mm -hmm. So these red flags, and I think that's also a big part of the fund selection process, you have to find the best ones, but you also have to eliminate the ones who have a red flag. And as an individual investor, you normally, again, if you don't have unlimited resources, you maybe don't find these red flags in a traditional due diligence. And that's where it the benefits of diversification really come in in terms in terms of shielding you to some degree from from bad actors. You know, to uh, key person risk is something which I think that approach helps with uh, concentration risk. In our case, also, and I think there maybe we can 
get into that a bit, you know, how are we actually investing? Because one of the things we try to do, contrary to some of the more venture capital oriented strategies, is also liquidity is very important mm-hmm. to us. And um, uh, the other aspect is uh, safety in terms of safe custody. So those two topics, I think, are, are also important and why we chose to, to go with a fund of funds approach. Because in our case, if you go with funds or a fund to fund approach, you don't have to worry about you know losing your private key. You don't have to take care of those custody aspects. Those are actually taken care of by by those fund managers and custodians that they use. And so that's a big part of our due diligence process. Um, maybe to explain a bit like what we actually invest in, um, Mark and you. So Mark's idle, and, yeah. and so the other Mark and you. Um, you often talk about you know structuring the portfolio with uh, offense, defense, and kind of midfield. So mm-hmm. yeah, you know often using that uh, that soccer uh, comparison. Can you explain that a bit? How how we're doing that? Yeah, I mean I have to say that was uh, Mark Seidel's uh, invention, <laughs> right? The soccer mm-hmm. team, yeah. but it's maybe a good visualization of what we're doing. I mean, you have like in other traditional asset classes and hedge funds all kind of different strategies from an absolute return, uh, let's say, approach where you generate far higher uh, returns uh, than in traditional assets, but still have a quite predictable outcome to maybe more uh, yeah, risk-taking strategies, um, long, short and all kind. I mean, normally, uh, I think leverage is not helping you in a market which is as volatile than uh, the whole digital asset space. But the idea is a little bit that we select a team based on the uh, soccer uh, uh, idea that you have a defense where you have the more conservative trading strategies. So those are more of the, I guess, the more the market neutral, <coughs> exactly, market long, neutral. short, and then uh, the, the long biased or long strategies are the exactly. more offensive ones. Exactly. Yeah. But still, I think you have to be cautious because, again, as crypto is far more volatile than, than other asset classes that maybe in the in the offense you have to maybe cut the extreme cases just because you don't want to have double digit uh, positive or negative uh, performances every month which is then just maybe not very sustainable from a from an investment perspective right, right. right but I think this um, approach of, of having different strategies in a in a concentrated portfolio, is exactly what makes the fund of fund uh, approach uh, very valuable because you don't have to go through all these hundred managers and because I mean just when you talk about the uh, uh, absolute return or market neutral I mean there are also dozens of different funds right so you can then just go through them to select one mm-hmm. or you have a, a portfolio where you cover among others these strategies right yeah it's it's What's also different to the traditional hedge funds, which you know I've I've been active in, is is really the fact that you're also looking at much younger players mm-hmm. and smaller funds. The uh, the amount of investment that a portfolio, you know, ours included, go puts into digital assets, I think, is still a, a small portion mm-hmm. of your overall invested portfolio, and um, so therefore the the funds that we're looking at tend to be much smaller than those big hedge funds that we use in, you know, in all weather, which, which, you know, have been around for decades in some cases, whereas here we're looking at younger players. So it's being close to those players, knowing those managers, knowing the scene and really understanding what they're doing is a challenge. And that's really what, uh, what you and, and Mark Seidel in particular are, are taking care of. And then Dirk Steinhoff and I, we kind of take care of more of that due diligence and, uh, kind of the old guy approach mm-hmm. and, and making sure that there's discipline in the, in the investment mm-hmm. process. So it is, it is quite involved. One of the things that we discussed quite a bit in the beginning was like, what do we actually mean by digital assets? What are we actually investing in? And I think that's maybe we can touch on that a bit. Um, you know, if we go through some of the themes and, uh, you know, that, we, that we're going into in these discretionary, in these, um, discretionary strategies, one that will be obvious, and, and there we're now going beyond cryptocurrency, right? Because everyone is talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum and those other cryptocurrencies, including now CBDCs and stable coins. Um, but the strategies or, or stories that we're investing in is much broader. So one area, for example, to discuss that everyone 
probably is aware of is the payment infrastructure. So basically the, uh, you know, the global remittance system, for example. Can you elaborate a bit on, on that example, on that use case? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, that's um, exactly what you um, mentioned um, in the beginning of, of, of the talk, right? That, I mean, you have the cryptocurrency element and they're mainly the, the, the uh, foundation of Bitcoin. And then you have the blockchain technology, which goes far further, right? Which is sometimes even unrelated to the currency space because you solve different problems and pain points. Mm. And I think for the payment field specifically, yeah, um, I mean, you have still a quite traditional way of exchanging uh, money or assets all over the world, uh, T plus whatever, right, in the worst <laughs> case, and if it's weak and nothing happens. And I think there, I think uh, it's obvious that this, that, that this will change completely. And uh, I mean, with Axedras, you also, to a certain extent, cover a uh, use case, which More is also helping chain exactly the supply chain case. field, yeah. where I also yeah. see huge potential but yeah you have some infrastructures based on traditional uh, infrastructures and uh, legacy especially um, which are established uh, but which should be also questioned maybe because mm -hmm. they make sometimes quite simple and straightforward processes extremely inefficient and expensive mm -hmm. and I think their blockchain technology can solve uh, and increase efficiency quite dramatically. So, and payment and, and supply chain, I think, are two of these very obvious fields. Others that we're invested in is uh, decentralized finance. So, for example, peer-to-peer -peer borrowing and lending. Uh, gaming, I think, is something that, that you and Mark are, are quite interested mm -hmm. in also. Um, sports, entertainment, blockchain, interoperability, that's a, that's a big one, I think. I don't know, do we want to elaborate on that a little bit? The, yeah, I mean, maybe also from a big picture, I mean, that you have a centralized platform which is literally getting all the value and in a certain dependency for the users. I think that's also something which is the status of the Web 2.0. And I think that's also not a bad thing. Some of the biggest tech companies, their business model is based on this centralized infrastructure. But when you look at the progress of technology and the opportunities decentralized uh, solutions are offering nowadays. I think it's also obvious that part of this business will literally move in a, in a more open and uh, decentralized world. And I mean, we talked about uh, the example of Facebook taking over the whole uh, party space, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, nowadays the question is uh, how relevant is Facebook? I mean, they did a few smart acquisitions, but I think the core business model mm -hmm. Of Facebook is heavily questioned and one of these drivers um, are these new ways of how you want to exchange information, how you want to store um, your literally virtual uh, identity, right? And that's why, I mean, that's uh, just reality in tech. You have these fast moving cycles and I think one of the biggest cycles which is literally right ahead of us is that uh, you have a shift from centralized institutions to decentralized ones, which is also maybe just the next stage of the digital revolution. And I think their blockchain and some of the use cases you just mentioned um, will, will play a crucial role. The, um, if you could put a timeline on it, what's your gut feeling with your experience? How long do you think it will take for that vision of DeFi, you know, decentralized finance, yeah. where kind of the traditional world of trading you know, is, is kind of transferred onto the new technology and the new way of doing things? Yeah, I mean, it's always difficult to predict because normally you mostly by far overestimate the short-term implications of, of innovation, mm. but also by far underestimate the long-term effect. So I would say we're still in the middle of the digital revolution, even if it started 25 uh, years ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what's maybe different that uh, you have still a lot of powerful institutions and regulators which are not because they're bad but they somehow have to preserve the status quo so you rather continue uh, based on on what's happening right now than looking into the future because that's not the job of the regulator right mm -hmm. on the other hand when you see uh, leapfrogging developments like the mobile phone in in countries or in in africa in general 
where instead of building traditional landlines, you could literally, yeah, right directly uh, move into mobile phones, right? I think we will see the similar developments um, in this field. And I mean, again, there are already a lot of things happening. Um, I don't know where we will see the tipping point. I think as soon as we have real world use cases, which just make uh, the, the, the value of a decentralized solution higher than the one of existing ones, we will see this shift. And I would say it will still take 10 years until these visionary ideas become reality. But at a certain point, I think it's an unstoppable development because it's just far more um, efficient to have uh, these new web uh, 3.0 or then maybe it's the 4.0 as the next development uh, phase. Um, then we have it right now, right? But yeah, I, I think, think ten I, year I, plus is uh, to bring it down ten <laughs> a realistic yeah, uh, yeah. ballpark number. But again, I mean that doesn't mean that you don't have a lot of opportunities right now as we speak, right? Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I would agree. I I I think it has used poten huge potential. At the same time, what you're saying, and I think that's important for investors, is to understand that there's so many different factors and, and forces at play and and we're really in a in a phase where uh, we're not just talking about technological innovation you know ai and all kinds of technological um, confluence of, of change right now there's all those geopolitical changes as well so we have to which then again have you know an effect on on regulations and so on so as an investor you really have to, I think, in my view, looking at digital assets, you have to be willing to put your toe in the water, mm -hmm. learn about it, um, start getting active, but at the same time also understanding that it's, there's like no clear path ahead. You know, we, we all don't really know how this will play out, what will happen with Facebook, how, how the market will evolve. And there's, there's a lot of unknowns and all the more, that's why I think we picked those active strategies and a diversified portfolio of active strategies so that you can, as we go, we can, we can adjust to, to the changes as they happen. Exactly. Yeah. And nobody can predict the future, right? But you definitely can see certain tendencies, which are, I think, very obvious. Before we go into longevity, Mark, uh, the, the whole arrival of Bitcoin, you know, was also accompanied by you know, uh, big promises of democratization of the financial industry, of, you know, uh, less bureaucracy, which we would definitely welcome, um, less regulations, more freedom. Those were some of the elements. To what degree do you think that will actually become reality where we are able to maybe counter the trend of more and more bureaucracy and centralist regulations? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think the idea... Um, behind a uh, decentralized solution is always to a certain extent challenging the existing framework, right? Because we are definitely in a phase where everything becomes more centralized and especially governments has, have for all kinds of reasons an interest to know and control everything in a more excessive way than in the past. On the other side, I'm also sometimes surprised that people who somehow try to understand how Bitcoin, for example, works, store their Bitcoin at the uh, middleman and then are surprised that if the middleman uh, goes down that their Bitcoin is lost because that's not really the idea mm -hmm. if you really want to take advantage of the decentralized infrastructure where you can store your asset directly without any middleman. So maybe need, still need some of these bad happenings uh, until people really realize um, what's the power uh, underneath and maybe not just from a speculative perspective buy the Bitcoin and put it into their traditional portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. So that's maybe one important fact, right? That you also have to somehow take advantage of these new technological breakthroughs because otherwise, yeah, you still are a little bit stuck in, a, in the traditional framework. Um, Going Maybe back just, to, just on that point, I yeah. think it's a really important one is that we have to mention that regulation um, would not have necessarily um, helped with the case of FTX. And at the same point also, I think it's um, it's not the technology that failed. It was really criminal energy. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so those episodes, you know, more regulation does not necessarily 
avoid yeah, it doesn't those solve, situations. Mm -hmm. It doesn't solve the, the real problems behind. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think uh, it's also, on the one hand, you have a lot of opportunities and additional freedom uh, out of these new technologies, but giving it to the wrong people can also literally, uh, you can use it also for the disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So literally, yeah, it's a little bit uh, the main issue with technology, right? You can take advantage of it or you can also use it and have a mere, more like dystopian future ahead of us. I personally always think, and that's just when you look at human history, that innovation and technology always um, succeeds. You can stop humans innovating and progressing. You can maybe try to slow certain uh, developments down and to preserve the status quo, maybe to try to control or to influence some of these developments. But at a certain stage, I think technology and human progress always, and I'm a very positive uh, uh, thinker into the right direction with very bad happenings in between. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we have now far more powerful technologies than we ever had. But as long as you have the smart and right people uh, using these technologies, I think ultimately it's always for the good for the broader masses on the long run. Yeah, and it's not like in the traditional world, we didn't have similar problems, right? Exactly. I mean, the Maddox of the world, that was still in a, in a different context. So it's not the technology that too has to evolve, but it uh, will always have abuse and manipulation and, and crime. So you have to be smart and you have to you know, stay on your feet. But I agree, overall, technology will, will probably per, you know, progress and, and uh, go forward. How we use it, that's, that's a big question, right? yeah. whether, whether we use it wisely. And when you look back just 100 years back, I, I think most people really underestimate how far uh, people came, right? I mean, literally, you always have the bad news in the daily newspaper, but the big picture is uh, that you have far less people living in poverty. The quality mm -hmm. of living on a global scale uh, has never been better than today, <laughs> but that's something people forget because you don't sell uh, good news, right? So right. it's always about the short-term crisis and there are a lot of bad things happening, but yeah. from a little bit historical perspective, I mean, human progress is just astonishing and I think nobody complaining about today would ever uh, want to live 200 years back, right? Correct. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, let's leave digital assets behind. So there we're looking at maybe 10 years um, where, where it comes to fruition. There's another other topic that you're invested in now, longevity. Mm -hmm. And I think there maybe that's more of something uh, 20 to 30 years out, but it's yeah. already starting as well. And you, yeah. That's another, you're, you're early in the game there. And uh, maybe tell us uh, what you're doing with Maximon, the yeah. company that you've tar started with your partners. Yeah, I mean, I have to say I'm following the whole space even before I explored Bitcoin in 2012. So I got mm -hmm. in contact with uh, Aubrey de Grey, that's one of, they call him the godfather of longevity. Back what, what's in, his name? Uh, Aubrey de Grey yeah. in 2009 at the conference. And uh, it's interesting to see how the whole space evolved because 20 years back, it was mainly the futurists <laughs> and the transhumanists in Silicon Valley talking about immortality and living for a thousand years. And most people didn't really look at them seriously. It was just like this crazy uh, futurists and then a few years back you had a uh, quite astonishing technological breakthroughs so literally only since a few years for the first time in human history scientists understand why humans age and that sounds quite silly but literally for the whole time of human existence it was not really uh, understood why we age it was just accepted you get born and then you get older and at a certain stage you die but it was not questioned and also not scientifically understood. And that's the big game changer that you nowadays, and we're also in the very early days, for the first time ever, have many smart scientists, professors all over the world only focusing on human aging. We're still trying to understand everything, so we're not there yet. But there is now a lot of money and a lot of smart people really focusing on this specific topic. So it moved from the scientific uh, from the crazy uh, science fiction field into something which is now really scientific uh, backed. And uh, so as far as 
your involvement in that? What's the mission or what's the strategy of, of Maximon in all of that? I mean, ultimately, we believe that um, aging uh, will, I mean, the definition and also the whole impact of aging will change dramatically in the years to come. Again, because you have now scientists trying to understand why we age and how we can influence aging and optimize uh, the aging process, which has a lot of effects and might be the biggest um, industry to come, right? Because ultimately everybody of us has a certain interest to age in a, in a good and, and a positive manner, right? And I think with Maximum we try to capitalize on this mega trend. So on the one side as a company builder we try to find the best uh, talent, the best researchers who are working and focusing on aging to bring services and products ideally today to the market which have a scientific and evidence-backed impact on the human aging. And on the other side, I think most people also forget that literally the life expectancy doubled in the last 100 years. So everybody here lives, lives twice as long than 100 years back. There were a lot of um, breakthroughs in, in medicine mm -hmm. and also some uh, improvements uh, in society. Lifestyle. But if you say it's unrealistic that we will all live for 120 healthy years, I mean, go 100 years back and everybody of us would have been already dead, right? So that's also something maybe going back to the other point. If you look at history, I think it's extremely unrealistic that we will not uh, increase our life and health span quite dramatically in the years to come. So is your goal to live to 120? I mean, ultimately, I try to live as long as possible in a, a, as good as possible health and happiness mode. But I think and that's a more conservative approach if you're uh, looking into the whole longevity space that 110 to 120 healthy years is something quite realistic um, based on the science we have right now. Maybe nothing you hear from uh, politicians yet, because we already have questions and discussions about increasing <laughs> uh, the, the work uh, time by half a year or so. So this will change completely. Macron is having some issues right now. Exactly. That, yeah. On the other side, from a long-term wealth perspective, I think it's the best thing um, you can do, that you increase the time where people are productive and healthy instead of literally fighting the symptoms of aging when you get old, when you get sick and then try to somehow extend uh, in a certain way often very miserable um, lifespan. I think that shouldn't be the main mission of, of our whole um, health system and that's unfortunately the case nowadays you fight the symptoms of aging so but then the the idea i think you guys mentioned that too on your website it's not so much about the lifespan it's more about the health exactly span. so that's the focus, to live healthy yeah. as long as possible and uh, yeah you know, and ideally that, that you, you start uh, yeah. by by really going to the roots of aging so by doing quite a few simple things literally as we speak you can heavily influence um, your status when you get old. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's also something which is far more tangible than most people think. It's not about what you do when you're 70, it's already what you can do nowadays, which will have a huge impact when you're then uh, older. So, so based on what you know now, I mean, in my view, I, I guess the question is how much of this is, um, first of all, based on genetics mm -hmm. and then also lifestyle, you know, think mindsets, uh, you know, how you, what you eat, your, your nutrition, sleep is very yeah. important, fitness. Um, to what degree can you add to that by, uh, with, with the scientific yeah. elements that you guys are talking about? I mean, honestly, it's, it's changing exponentially, right? I mean, you have nowadays certain treatments which really have a tremendous impact on your age already. Most of these treatments and, and, and uh, products are quite expensive. So like always, you have not a mass market for these solutions yet. So what, what kind of treatments are those? I mean, it starts with uh, simple things like, for example, red light therapy or oxygen chamber, cryo chamber, where you can really measure that it has an impact on your cells. It's not just that you feel better. It's really me uh, measurable. And then it goes further to... Uh, for example, blood cleansing, something most people only hear from when you have uh, intoxication or something, but you can do this mm -hmm. also in a, 
in a healthy mood with a lot of positive uh, side effects. And then let's say the more extreme uh, route is the blood plasma transfusion, literally close to the vampires, <laughs> which is mostly illegal and also ethically questionable. But these are all things which are happening as we speak and you don't normally read about it. Mm -hmm. And you can really prove and show um, that it has an impact on your age. So in terms of Maximum, you mentioned the word before, a uh, company builder. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Is that like an incubator approach or what, what yeah, exactly? Yeah, the terms are a little bit blurry. You can call it incubator, venture studio, uh, company builder. What we do, we really start these companies together with other founders and scientists ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we finance them up to 10 million ourselves. So before we go out and get additional investors on board, we literally, that's our promise to our founders, we keep the back free. They can fully focus on their business. We help them with everything which is necessary, but maybe not the core competence of passionate founders like bookkeeping, all the legal framework, the funding, so they can really run and focus on their business. And as entrepreneurs ourselves, I think we somehow want to help these uh, new emerging em uh, em entrepreneurs to really focus on their core strength and the core business. So what are the kinds, can you talk about some of the companies that you're now invested in? Or um... Yeah, I mean, we literally, we, we in the last two years since we launched Maximum, we now have uh, four companies launched. Two of them are operational, generating revenue every day. So our first company, uh, which is live now since roughly a year, uh, is uh, in the supplement field. So we produce and sell supplements which have an impact on the aging of humans and uh, the company is, is, is doing great. We have a month-to-month -month growth by uh, close to 30%. have now our first own pot patented supplement on the market based on collagen where we can also based on all kind of studies prove that it has a far higher um, uh, effect uh, on your cells than traditional uh, collagen supplements. It was so what, what does that do? I mean, collagen is one of the main ingredients of, of your cells, right? And the older you get, to really simplify it, the less collagen you have. So at a certain point, it really makes sense to add from external additional collagen, but maybe not as a cream like the beauty industry tries to sell you because that doesn't really help anything mm -hmm. besides mm -hmm. the moisture of, of the cream. But if you take it as a supplement, um, it has really an impact on literally the um, consistency of your cells with all kind of side effects as we might know uh, nails hairs and everything mm -hmm. but these are all just side effects of the general increased health of your cells by taking certain of these supplements okay and that's a patented product basically. that's this in point. this case something where there's a professor who researched in Harvard and ETH of Zurich for the last nine years only on, on this specific substance and we were able to now buy it out of ETH and uh, patent it and bring you the product great. to the market. You look great. Are you taking that collagen? I mean, that's only existing since I mean, you're weeks, 105 years old. Exactly. So yeah. no, I mean, I have should to tell say, everyone that so they yeah, know that I mean, it really works. <laughs> I, I would say my, my because I was completely not into this field, I mean, I was interested, but I was not really mm -hmm. doing anything you should for your health. Supplements for me was only snake oil, but now as, a, <laughs> as I'm really into the space and see also the science and the studies behind, it's really astonishing what you can do. And I feel a lot of also short-term effects. So you've started some to take these. supplements exactly. actually now with, with the learnings and everything. Exactly. And I would say in our company, in our group, we are now roughly a little bit more than 40 people. Most of them are naturally quite into their own health. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really astonishing what we see. We do a yearly bio age test where you can literally uh, measure your biological age and uh, it's astonishing how you can influence certain elements by lifestyle certain elements by taking or doing some uh, longevity related treatments so you it guys really are also helping impact. people in those other dimensions like like fitness and, and the exactly. mindset i don't know mindfulness one of our companies is literally offering exactly that okay. we take your dna and uh, we look at your lifestyle, what you eat, what you do, sports, everything. And then you have a global team of specialists based on your DNA and your individual uh, setup, helping you to increase your health and uh, lifespan by sometimes just changing some smaller things in your daily routines. So that's also astonishing. It's hyper-personalized. So that's another company. So one exactly. is supplements. 
one is really more of a holistic approach in terms of lifestyle, I guess? Exactly. I mean, yeah. ultimately based on data and the uh, latest science, we can individually guide you okay. into your own longevity journey. So there's like a coaching that goes with it? Or, um, exactly. You have yeah. literally like a hyper-personalized team of uh, specialists from all over the world, from exercise, nutrition, food, sleep. That sounds expensive. What, so what's what's the... Uh, I mean, that's uh, one of the uh, offerings which are definitely not mainstream yet. So this yeah. program costs twenty five to 75,000 a year, yeah. which sounds maybe a lot in so the beginning. So that's more than a personal trainer. That's exactly. actually someone. Exactly. That's yeah, really, you have holistic. literally like... Yeah. So it's a team of coaches, kind of. Exactly, yeah. Okay. And I can tell you with this price tag, we're rather cheap because in this target okay. audience, you have a lot of people that have their own medical doctors, medical family office supporting them. I see. So it's an interesting field. Again, something which is quite elite and expensive at the moment. But our thesis is that because uh, literally your DNA um, it's the same if you're ultra rich or if you're poor, it's not different, right? Mm -hmm. So literally mm -hmm. you can have the same indications and same results. Mm -hmm. At the moment, the problem is that it's still quite expensive. But I mean, we see exponential decrease of all these uh, treatments and ultimately we are in the space to democratize all these developments. That's, I think, also the business case behind going forward. What are the other two companies all about? And one is building uh, walk-in clinics for longevity treatments. So okay. literally the plan is to open the first store here in Zurich in July, where you can literally book your appointments. So there will be uh, Maximum walk-in clinics. I exactly. Okay. I mean, it, it, it's called Live Lounge um, because okay. Maximum is only the brand of the group behind. And then something we're also working on, which is maybe more the mega trend behind, is that we want to build something we call it the Soho House for elderly. The what? The Soho House for elderly people. So instead of spending Soho your time. Soho House. Soho House. You know the Soho House? No. Yeah, it's like a cool, fancy hotel chain all over the world for okay. a little bit uh, cooler, arty farty audience. <laughs> and uh, we want to build something similar, but for elderly people, because uh, in our existing system, you normally you work, you're retired, I don't know, then you're on the cruise ship for a few years or you don't know what to do and then you go to your elderly care uh, center. And I think there's a growing number of retired people which are still very healthy, which are really eager to do something, but their needs are not really very well covered. And our idea is to build a hotel chain where you literally have from yoga in the morning, joint opera visits with other peers, so literally an offering for all these people which are still healthy and happy enough to do something without uh, working full-time anymore before they maybe go the traditional route. So a lifestyle service that is holistic. Exactly, uh, because okay. we, we think the longevity um, developments is, is a huge mega trend, mm -hmm. so it's not just about selling supplements and treatments, it also has a huge impact on literally all Mm -hmm. aspects on your life right. so that's why um yeah we're also looking into these uh, elements of the the companies or i guess you could say even health interventions you know that you guys are looking at and that maximon is now investing in um in your view what's the most promising you know in the in the coming years maybe also looking ahead a bit further i mean the biggest Change, which sounds quite unspectacular, is really that you look at aging from a preventive perspective. Because as I said in the beginning, our whole system is based on as soon as you're sick, you get mostly for free because you paid for with the whole, uh, uh, I don't know, Krankenkasse uh, system, in, right? In Swiss German, flashterly politik. Exactly. You, you, you fighting get the symptoms. The, the yeah. drugs as soon as you're sick, right? Right. And the older you get, normally the thicker you get, so the more expensive the whole thing becomes and you have more and more pills and literally 80% of the whole costs in the health system are in the last 18 months of your life, which right. is completely silly, right? Mm -hmm. So literally turning back this system where you think, where you try to identify what you could do now to ideally decrease the chances and the effects of these age-related diseases. I think that is the biggest shift we will see. So that, that's really a mindset change. And I mean, do you see that starting and happening already? Because currently, I mean, if we look at health insurance, if we look at our, uh, you know, the pharma and medical system, it's it still seems, to me, it still seems everything going in the same direction of, 
Not yeah, really it's starting slowly. I mean, when you go to the fitness center now, you get part of it paid by by the system, right? True, because true. it makes sense that people do sports to yeah. a certain extent. And I think that's that's the first uh, step, right? I mean, at the moment, you have a whole industry which is quite happy about selling new drugs as soon as you're sick, and that's also not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But I think if you do the complete calculation, you would realize that it's far more efficient to literally try to identify the roots of aging and uh, fight these foundations of aging instead of fighting the symptoms when it's literally already too late. That would really be a, a huge change. I think um, really the impact that that could do, and I think that's also where self-responsibility and everything should, yeah, should be brought extent, back. Yeah, to a extent, I mean, uh, you yeah. can say if you're sick and uh, at a certain age based on your lifestyle behavior, it's quite unfair that everybody has to pay for that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you, I mean, okay, as a smoker, you pay a high taxes, but at the end, I think this will never refinance the costs you will generate in your latest phase of your life. Mm -hmm. So the system is, is, is completely unfair, right? So in terms of Maximum's contribution to that change of mindset, what are the projects or, or um, ideas that you have in that regard? I mean, we are um, talking to quite a few governments and politicians, honestly, and there are some countries which are definitely understanding what's happening, because also from a government perspective, it's far better to have healthy and productive older people than everybody in sick care at the end of the life, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it needs some time, because it's still this misperception that meaning longer means overpopulation, means more waste, means... Mm -hmm. Uh, inefficiency is, is completely wrong, right? I mean, also it's when you also look the at whole social security exactly, system, you which have is to change of many things, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, our whole social security system is also based on a life expectancy which just increased by more than twenty years in the last few years. Yeah. So the whole model is completely outdated, mm -hmm. yeah. and some of these numbers are also mani manipulated, right? Because it would even need further commitments from the workforce to extend this span where you work to literally be able to finance this gap, right? Can you talk about which countries are open to those ideas at this point? I mean, you have in this field literally two countries which are definitely ahead of the curve. One is Singapore. Singapore. And the other okay. one is funnily Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has in the health minister uh, had a sub-responsible uh, person for wellness and longevity. And they also, you can uh, Google it, they uh, last year announced a new initiative where they allocate one billion per year to extend the health span and longevity of their people. Because the problem of some of these rich countries and the worst example is the US, right? Where the life expectancy is literally decreasing since a few years because you have obesity and all these kind of lifestyle related uh, sicknesses in the age. So... You have so I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. So life expectancy in the U.S. has started yeah. to, to... So currently, what is it um, for for males? How much? How high is it in I mean, the I US? know that in Switzerland, it's uh, 71 years healthy and then roughly 13 years in a non-very healthy mode, so 84. Okay. And we try to shrink these 13 years mm -hmm. by ultimately extending the health span as a side effect i think you will also live longer than the 83 uh, three years on average mm -hmm. and switzerland is already quite on top i think japan switzerland Doing quite well yeah. finland they're on top and in the u.s that has started yeah to massively change. massively they were both, already for both uh, genders yes for, yes so men and, and women are exactly and the big part is is, is uh, the whole sugar intake right mm -hmm. And a lot of lifestyle elements. I mean, it's not that big and, and a bad uh, also health system in general, which mm -hmm. also doesn't help. Mm -hmm. But in the US, it's quite dramatic. And it also generates What about a countries lot of like cost. China? Because they have an obesity problem as well, right? I think in yeah. China, part of the culture is um, if you're fat, you're rich. And so there, there's some yeah. issues there when you come from a, you know, being a rural society, going to an urban society. I think. That has been a huge problem for them. Yeah, and in general, you have these transitions. I, I mean, I would also say that a few years back, it was like a show of uh, wealth uh, that you were definitely Obese. not too slim, right? <laughs> and that's maybe also changing. And I think ultimately, I think people are now realizing that some of these lifestyle uh, behaviors are maybe socially accepted, but definitely not good for the, your long-term health, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why, I mean, it goes in both directions, right? Also. Right. 
just understanding that food is literally the fuel of your body. So depending on what you eat, it has so many effects on everything in your daily life, from the mind to your body to your health. I think these are all things which are now definitely changing, right? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I'll have to look into. I've always been a bit suspect, you know, of um, or suspicious of, of supplements. You know, I think it's um, every body is so different. And actually, if you lead a healthy lifestyle, I think that that makes a big difference. But um, yeah, I'll definitely look into uh, some of the things. I mean, that you, you should. I was doing. also very skeptic, and yeah. now purely based on science and, and, and numbers and studies. It's really astonishing. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there are quite a few scientists who say it will be in a few years from now quite normal that the government gives you certain supplements for free mm -hmm. just because uh, like other services, it increases the general well-being and, and the health of a society. Right. And uh, I mean, that's still a future project but I think people look back because some of these supplements even if you do everything right in your daily uh, routines with food and sports you can't just replicate in your body mm -hmm. so you need to mm -hmm. take it from the outside as an additional supplementation mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. interesting so Mark I think you've already I mean if I if we kind of go towards the close you've already kind of talked a bit about the greatest opportunities here because I think that is one the mindset you know taking more responsibility with your health but mm -hmm. um, as we go towards the end um, maybe just in general your view on the greatest risks and opportunities looking forward you know you with uh, with your being early yeah in, in many different markets where do you see the greatest challenges and opportunities as for investors but also in yeah. general yeah I mean again I'm always quite positive uh, with my outlook I think you have a uh, time in human history where a lot of things are changing in a very dramatic way with maybe very extreme short-term effects, some of them negative, some of them positive. But I think there's also a tremendous upside and increased wealth and health and general well-being on a global scale with all these new techno technological developments. And I think not being part of it, meaning have a certain allocation as a investor in these new emerging uh, fields mm -hmm. is, is maybe the, the, the biggest risk you can have, right? Because then you miss what's happening. Mm -hmm. And one is the financial uh, uh, side. The other one, I think, is also that you should somehow, to a certain extent, also understand what's happening. And that's why I always say investing in these new exciting technologies and developments is normally also helping you to somehow understand what's happening. Because mm -hmm. if it's in your portfolio, and ideally uh, growing, you maybe increase the interest to also understand what's happening in these new fields. Absolutely. So that's why to You have somehow to get your hands ignore, dirty exactly. to some degree. Yeah. So ignoring these huge developments and, and mega trends coming together on all kinds of levels is, is, is definitely a big mistake, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I think uh, uh, yeah, alternative assets, maybe that's now coming uh, with all these developments together, the, the, the best moment to somehow have a certain uh, focus and You have allocation. to do it smartly and, and uh, cautiously, but um, learning by doing is Exactly, is what understanding what's, yeah. what's happening, yeah. right? Awesome. Mark, thank you so much. This was yeah, so exciting. Thanks for I having me. I think we me. could go on for, for longer. Yeah, but, we touched uh, quite different <laughs> topics, right? <laughs> this was great. Thank you so much. Thank you much. very much. Thanks. <laughs>